Jesus conversation that maybe you had this week. Or maybe there was a missed opportunity for that Jesus conversation and you need boldness or a second chance to plant that seed. You know, we are praying for these, that these seeds that we're planting would be would be sown into Jesus' followers, spreading his love throughout all of Casper, the surrounding areas, and anywhere else that you may be watching. 
So let's just pray that God would continue to encourage and embolden us to do this. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to just gather in your name as one body. Father, we lift up all of these things, all of these names and these conversations that we have had the opportunity to have. And we just pray that you would continue to whisper in their ear, I'm here and I love you. God, we just give you all the praise, all the glory, and it is in your mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now let's just continue to lift up our voices in praise as we sing to our Heavenly Father today. Let's sing this together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been.
Welcome to Highland Park Community Church. My name is Casey, and we are so excited that you're joining us today. Let's take a minute and talk a little bit about your next steps here at Highland. We believe that your first step should be towards community. If today is your first time, or if Highland has been your church home for years, truly the best way to get connected with our family and start meeting others is through community groups. To find the group that's perfect for you, visit us online at the link below, text the word groups to the number below, or simply head to the place in the lobby and we would love to see you. Being part of a community means serving and taking the next step is a vital part of our faith journey and something that's not only encouraged but necessary if we are going to grow to be more like Jesus. There are many areas within the life of the church that are in need of your time and giftings. To find out where, please stop by Go Central today for more information. You may also visit our website at the link below. As we continue to work together to get through this pandemic, we ask that if you aren't feeling well or you've been exposed to the coronavirus, please stay home and join us for church online. Please let us know what's happening in your life and how we can pray for you. Each Tuesday, our staff gathers together to pray fervently over every request. Visit our website at the link below to fill out a prayer and connection card and visit the information desk if you need a physical card. At HPCC, we take risks to pursue God and love like Jesus. Because of this, we are fully united in making sure that everyone in the surrounding area knows that Jesus loves them. Our goal is to have 50,000 Jesus conversations. And each time you have a Jesus conversation, use a new 2021 sticker to add your conversation to the wall in the atrium. Add us to your calendar by making plans to join us for Easter Jam on Wednesday, March 24th at 6.30 p.m. This pre-Easter event brought to you by HPCC Kids includes games, music, the Easter story, and great fun for the entire family. Tickets are free, but we do ask that you register your family online at the link below. Then we would like to invite you to join us for one of our four Easter Sunday services. They are at 8, 9, 15, 10, 30, and 11, 45. Our nursery will be available at 9, 15, and 10, 30. If you call Highland Home and do not have children ages three and under, we ask that you consider attending either the 8 a.m. or the 11.45 a.m. service to accommodate our first time guests. As we continue to worship, may I encourage you to offer God your tithes and offerings. You can give on our app or our website. You may also drop your tithes in one of the baskets as you exit the sanctuary today. Your obedience through giving continues to make a huge impact by making Highland Park a place for new believers to belong and become more like Jesus. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Hey, good morning. Man, it's so good to see you guys. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Okay, so as you were listening to, watching that bumper video, listening to that voice, that voice is one of the uh, women on our, on our worship team. You guys know her as Susan McLeod. And this is why I'm telling you this is if you have the YouVersion app, you can get YouVersion to read the Bible for you. James Earl Jones was a great addition, but I'm telling you, I think Susan McLeod has got something to bring to the table. I was like, man, I would love to listen to her read the Bible on a daily basis for us, man. Wouldn't that be great? So again, when you see her, you should pitch that to her, and before you leave, give her a hug, because she loves hugs. She's so extroverted, she can't help herself. And if she squirms, that's just her enjoying it. So, you know, there you have it. Well, I wanted to, uh, before we dive in here, I just wanted to uh, pass along some fun information and uh, some thanks to you. Throughout, uh, throughout the months, throughout the years, uh, God brings different opportunities uh, across our path. And God brought an opportunity to be able to help those in human trafficking. And we were able to partner with a ranch called Hope Ranch in Wichita, Kansas, and so I wanna say thank you for your faithfulness and obedience because every time you give, God does something really cool with it. And this is a note uh, from Hope Ranch, some people you'll never meet, but God used your life, Highland Park, to touch 
these lives. So here you go. Highland Park Community Church, we are thanking God for you. We want to thank you so much for your gift to the Hope Ranch for women. It is because of your faithfulness that we are able to help women escape and heal from the awful horrors of abuse and human trafficking. This past week, we accepted one new woman into our residential program. This spring, three women will graduate from the same program in Jesus' name. Thank you guys for your faithfulness to the kingdom. And so I wanna say thank you guys for your faithfulness. And uh, it's amazing how God is always able to do immeasurably more than we could ever dare to ask, hope, dream, or imagine. And how he just connects dots and he writes stories and he connects people. And uh, so if you wanna learn more about it, you can check out the Hope Ranch. Uh, I think it's .com and, uh, or Google it. It's in Wichita, Kansas. You can hear more about it. Well, I'm super excited for today as we continue our series, Fan Into Flame. It's a mini series that we've done, and the whole idea is just focusing on how God has uniquely equipped you for the plans that he has for your life. This series is all about God's plan for your life. One of my favorite passages that I love to share with you on a weekly basis is Ephesians 2.10. And it simply says, Paul says this to the church. Some translations read that we're God's handiwork. Some translations read we're God's workmanship. My favorite translation of it is we're God's masterpiece. What that says is you're a one of a kind. There is not another one of you. You are a masterpiece created by God. And we are God's masterpiece, created the church is God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God planned long ago. What that tells us, church, what that tells us, I want you to own this, I want this, this is, this is, this is God to you right now, his spirit speaking. I would simply say this, for the rest of the morning, those with ears to hear, let them hear what the spirit of God has to say to you that God has plans for your life that only you can do. God has plans for your life that only you can do. Today, he's got plans for your life that only you can do. And it's just within the natural ebb and flow of your life, God brings opportunities in. You don't have to go and think, oh, do I've gotta do this, do I have to do that? You see, that's the beauty about God, is God is the one who made the plans, and he equips you with the tools that you're gonna need to carry out the work that he planned for you long ago. And it is at that point where we share the inspiration for this series. God has given you everything you need for the work that he planned long ago. He's given us his spirit and his Holy Spirit who lives in us has equipped us with what is known as a spiritual gift, and it is the Spirit who empowers that gift. You don't have to do anything but show up and allow the Spirit to flow through you. Our job is to know what that gift is, to fan it into flame, and to let it flow through you. And so please turn in your Bibles with me as we look at this one more time. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul is talking to Timothy. Timothy was his apprentice. He was a follower, and Paul came across Timothy during one of the missionary journeys, and he saw God's God's gifting of Timothy, and there's a call on his life, and Timothy goes on to become a pastor in one of the largest cities, Ephesus, and Paul is writing to Timothy to encourage him. He says, for this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. What Paul is reminding Timothy, church, is that God had plans for his life. And those plans included being a pastor in Ephesus where he was going to shepherd people, lead people. He'd be part of leading that church, caring for that church, praying, discerning. And Paul is reminding him of God's unique plan. And Paul's reminding Timothy that God had uniquely gifted him for that work through the Holy Spirit. It was Timothy's job to fan that gift into flame. Last week, I introduced you to some of these spiritual gifts. We're gonna again put them up on the screen. But these are some of the gifts that the Spirit gives. 
Nobody gets all of them. We receive some of them, and some are more dominant than others. There will be gifts that are more dominant than others, but you see like administration, ruling, apostleship, pioneering. You see things like teaching and serving and mercy and, and hospitality, giving, knowledge, leadership. Prayer is a, is a spiritual gift. It is God through his spirit who gives the gift, equips us and empowers us with it. Paul's charge to Timothy was to know his gift, which he did, and to fan it into flame and to let it flow. That is the same charge that God has to us through Paul, through his word, that as church, we are to know what our gift is, to fan it into flame, and to let it flow out of our lives. Last week, I heard several stories of people who were sharing how they went on giftstest.com and discovered their gift. This is awesome. If you don't know what your gifts are, what you need to do is you need to get to giftstest.com. This test will take about five, 10 minutes, but it'll help you identify as a follower of Jesus that gifting that God gave you. And this isn't something that you go, oh, that's neat. No, this is going to be something that's gonna be vital and pivotal. It's gonna play a significant role in your everyday living. So go to giftstest.com if you don't know what yours is because it'll help you discover it. And then your job is to, once you know what it is, It'll give a definition of it. The team up here is gonna share a definition of some of these gifts today. Your job is to fan it into flame. And what that means is you just let it flow. You know what it is, and you look for opportunities to use it in the relationships, in the activities, in the natural order of your day. Relationships, activities, fan that gift, use it. Let that gift just flow out of you in those moments. That is God's charge to us. If we could put, uh, if we could put First Timothy chapter one verse six up here again, I want to help us look at it in in a new way as well. Just another angle of this verse. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Theologians and historians alike agree that Timothy was not faltering; he was not buckling underneath the weight of the job that God had given him. Paul is simply encouraging him. He is simply coaching him up. He's reminding Timothy, keep the main thing, Timothy, the main thing, which is shepherding, leading the church that is gonna make disciples who make disciples. Timothy, you are uniquely called to this church. You are uniquely gifted for this role. You need to fan it into flame. And as we look at it from that, this, as we look at this verse from that angle, something very clearly, obviously pops out to us. And it's this, is that everybody, even the best, still need coaching. Even the best still need coaching. I grew up in Michigan. Many of you guys know that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, won the Super Bowl uh, just a few weeks ago. What did the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Michigan have in common? We have Tom Brady in common. That's what we have in common. And whether you like him or not, it is undeniable. He is the greatest quarterback who has ever played the game. Do you want to know what makes him the greatest quarterback in the game? As good as he is, he is arguably the best. But the thing that he has to have, and he knows it, if he seeks it out, he always wants to be coached up. Coach me up. He's always looking for coaching. The point is, even the best need coaching. I sit here and I look out in this room, and I know that there are those of us who are further along in your faith journey. And what the Holy Spirit wants to remind us today is regardless of where you're at, like even those of you way down the road, do not forget that God has plans for your life, that you are uniquely gifted. The Spirit wants to coach you up this morning and remind you, today is not just another day that ends in Y. It is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's participate in the work that God has for you, and he's coaching you up. And for some of that coaching, it's a kick in the pants. He's saying, you've been on the sideline too long. It's time to get back in the game. But for others of us 
who might be more timid, he's saying, no, you can do this. Get in the game. Know your gift. Fan it into flame. When you fan it into flame, when you know your gift, passion sparks. Purpose is identified. And the Holy Spirit stirs and gives you opportunities to dream new dreams and see these days, these hours, these minutes that God has given us in brand new ways. And so with that being said, I want to turn it over to Brittany. I'm going to punt it over to you and uh, tell us about the gift of evangelism. Well, yeah. Well, hello. I'm uh, Brittany, Brittany Valentine. I'm one of the youth pastors here at Highland Park, and um, I have a variety, like all of us, of spiritual gifts, um, and I use those in my, not only my role here, but in um, in relationships that I have in my span of influence that God has given me. And so, yes, I'm going to talk to you guys about the spiritual gift of evangelism. And an evangelist, just biblically defining, is someone who brings good Good news, And so in our Christian context, that good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he's done for us and his redeeming work for all of humanity. And so as, um, as I've been considering this and thinking through it, um, I, I kind of have this tension that I, I've experienced. I thought, okay, well, if we're all believers and, and we've all been given this message, aren't we all called to share the gospel with the people in our lives, right? Aren't we all called to do that? So what's the point of there being a spiritual gift about evangelism? So does that mean like if you don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism, then you're like off the hook? Well, (laughs) as I studied it more, I realized no, 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 that doesn't mean that at all. There is a distinction between the two, and um, this is the reason I chose um, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 6, and I totally encourage you guys to check it out, but Paul is talking about how the same God who said at the beginning of creation, said, let there be light, and there was light, he's shining a light in us as we come to know the glory of God through Christ, and that light is meant to shine into the world, and so we're all called to share the gospel, but there are some of us who have been given a supernatural gift and ability to share the gospel um, and, and use the spiritual gift of evangelism. And so in my own life and how I apply it, my definition for evangelism is the ability, or rather the divine ability, to strategically present the gospel with anyone God places in your path. So <laughs> I'm a little bit of an ambivert, um, with more of an introverted bent, which basically means I can kind of be extroverted sometimes, but I definitely prefer being an introverted person. So this whole idea of, you know, going out on the street corner and being like, you know, here's the gospel and you need to repent or finding a random stranger and telling them the gospel is not really my style. I'm not against it because there are times where maybe I need to do that, but that's not how I'm wired just naturally. I don't think that way, but... I have the gift of evangelism. And as I've reflected on my life and all the places that God has taken me since I came to faith in Christ, I can see how I've used strategy. That's the reason I use strategically in this definition. I've used strategy to reach people and share the gospel with them. And oftentimes it works for me as relationships where I meet someone and I find out maybe they aren't saved and I begin to build a relationship with them. I begin to get to know them. I begin to understand their story. And through understanding their story, through multiple conversations, I then am able to share the gospel with them in a way that maybe makes more sense to them with where they're at in their lives. And I'm human and I struggle and I will tell you for sure that the reality of the fear of rejection is so, so tangible for me and the the fear of maybe not saying the right thing or offending someone, that's a real deal for me. But here's what it always comes down to in my heart when I think through it. If I end up being the only person who shares the gospel with this person, then I am willing to take that risk for the sake of their souls. No matter how rejected I get, how offended I make them, how maybe they will never wanna talk to me again, if I get that chance, I'm gonna take it because it matters so much to me that they hear the redeeming work of Christ. And so, as I said before, you know, we're all called to share the gospel and share Jesus in our own frame of influence in whatever capacity God gives us, but there are some of us that are actually gifted by the Spirit 
to evangelize. And so if you wake up in the morning maybe and just the idea of getting to share the gospel with someone, whether it's a coworker, whether it's someone you've never met before, whether it's your children, whoever it is, if you wake up and you think about that and you're excited about it and that drives you and motivates you, then you very well may have the gift of evangelism. And I would encourage you to fan that into flame and not only just go out and share the gospel more, but to all the other brothers and sisters that you have here that maybe they don't have that gift, encourage them, equip them, motivate them, help them to reach the people that are in their lives and their unique span of influence. Because as a church, we're given these spiritual gifts to encourage and edify and equip one another. And we can do this as a team. Brittany, it is so evident to me that God has got you exactly where he wants you to be. Thank you so much. I'm a recovering alcoholic drug addict, and my name is Chris, and I'm also a follower of Jesus Christ. At Celebrate Recovery, we introduce ourselves that way so that the person that is walking through the door for the very first time can immediately resonate with us. And it also brings up that there's been a huge amount of mercy given to me in my life, that spiritual gift of mercy. It's been so amazing, I've, the transformation of my life, going from a selfish, self-centered person that didn't care at all about anyone else to wanting to serve other people and making that priority in my life and, and the, the gift that that has been. Those who have been forgiven much, much is required, but it's not a burden, it's a joy, it's a privilege, it's, it's a, the most important thing in my life. So mercy, it says, a blessing that is an act of divine favor or compassion, which basically means to me that I didn't get the punishment I deserve for the things that I had done. And why not? Because you see, Jesus Christ took that hit for me and he took it for all of us when he died on the cross for the redemption, for the reconciliation of all of our sins. It's because of this mercy that we need to go out and tell other people that they too are not condemned for the things that they have done when they declare Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their lives. So in go and do that, we go to the prison system and we take them clothes and we take them food. We serve food every Friday night at Celebrate Recovery. We have taken Gatorade to the Indian reservations to people that were positive with COVID because they had nothing to drink. We also have given gifts to the children of incarcerated parents. And most importantly, we want everyone to know that they are worth it. They are worth the mercy and God's love as well. We got to go out to the therapeutic community during COVID. We were not allowed to go in. We haven't been able to go in for almost a year. But a group of us went out and we took flashcards, big giant flashcards, cardboard testimonies. And through the gates, through the fences, the guys were lined up at the windows and, and we're, we're, we're tearing our testimonies through, the, through those cards and flipping them over so you can see the transformation in our lives. And these guys are banging on the windows back every time. Banging on the windows was an amen. amen. Clicking their fingers is an amen. If what I have just shared with you, if that brings a spark to you, let's fan that flame. There is so much work to be done for the kingdom of God. If that sparks you, let's go. Man, Chris, I love that reminder that we all have been given a gift that we don't deserve, and we can live out of that in our giftedness and uh, in the mercy that God gives us. Well, Highland Park, it's good to be with you this morning. My name is Jason Pierantoni. I'm the other youth pastor here, so I work with Brittany. She and I help to just come alongside the teenagers in our community and teach them who Jesus is and then walk alongside them as they navigate through this crazy, crazy world that we're in. And so in that, in that role that I have, I get to use my giftings, and one of those is the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching has been used all throughout Scripture to help build up the body of believers, the body of Christ. We see it in the Old Testament, teaching in the synagogues, in the temples, and then Jesus teaching thousands about the kingdom of God, the apostles, Peter, Paul and Timothy, these amazing men that taught and built up the body. 
I, have, I get to use this gift in my role here with kids. And I love, I wanna get define it here because I think sometimes we can find it hard to know what, how to use this gift. So the gift of teaching is the divine ability to study and learn from the scriptures, primarily to bring understanding and depth to other Christians. I love this definition because of this first part. The best teachers are always the best students. And so as teachers of the word, we have to be in the word, constantly letting it transform us, renew our mind, and continue to be transformed by scripture every day and day in, day out. We cannot impart what we don't, we don't comprehend, we don't understand. We cannot impart that if we don't have it for ourselves. I had a professor explain it this way, that our students should be drinking from a, fro- a flowing stream rather than a stagnant pool. So if you have to get to teaching, you probably have a desire to be in the word, hung- a hunger for the word of God, and let it transform you daily. And then we have to go out and impart this understanding to others. And so I think I've fallen, been guilty of this myself, but we sometimes see the people in scripture like Paul and Timothy who are teaching thousands of people. And we say, I don't have a pulpit. God hasn't given me thousands of people to teach to, so I must not have that gift. Church, that is a life in the pit of hell that smells like smoke. Because God has given us a gift that we can use no matter where we are. We don't have to have a pulpit or people to teach to. We just can do it in our daily lives, our relationships with others. In a small group, in a one-on-one relationship, we can teach others. So if you have, if you have the gift of teaching, you can't help but to look for opportunity. You are eager to impart understanding, biblical truth to others. It's just something you can't, you can't contain. If you have this gift, fan it into flame. Be, be open to the opportunities that God has placed before you to impart that understanding to others. Use this gift, fan it into flame to build up the body of believers. I'm supposed to say something about his gift. No, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm so glad for these kids that are coming along behind us and are leading our youth. But um, Jason, I do appreciate so much the fact that we can talk about the gift of teaching and we don't have a platform. Most of us don't. But we do have a coffee table or a kitchen table. We can go to, the, you know, sit around and um, visit with people at uh Perkins or wherever you want to have pie, and you can still uh, use your gift of teaching, which I love, and you, you said that so well. You know, all of us, uh, all of us and all of you, we all have multiple gifts. We don't just have one gift, but we have a gift mix, and um, so I have the gift of teaching, and that's probably where my small group stuff comes in, and I also have other gifts, but one, one of the Um, primary gifts that I have is the gift of hospitality. Typically, you know, we think of hospitality as something that we do, you know, that we clean our houses, we prepare a meal, we get ready for guests, we invite them in, we hopefully have uh, a conversation that is, you know, uh, meaningful. Or maybe we're one of those people that uh, no matter what's going on, you know, they will say, hey, would you mind if our friend stayed with you for the night as they pass through or, or we're having a memorial service and we need beds and that people open their homes. And a lot of times that's what we think of when we think of hospitality. It's meeting people's needs. And that is certainly, certainly true. When we, um, but, but I have to say that when the, the gift of hospitality is spoken about in the scriptures, when they are lauding, um, the writers are lauding people for being, uh, having the gift of hospitality, it is not just a, a woman's gift. In fact, my man's man, uh, son-in-law, he has the gift of hospitality in his gift mix because he loves to cook and have people at his home. And so it is both um, a gift that men and women have. When we look at scriptures, the gift of hospitality is always framed by words like this. Let love continue. Be friendly, cordial, gracious, sharing what you have with others. Be ready to practice hospitality. Romans 12 is this beautiful passage that talks about what we're supposed to look like and what we're supposed to do when we are Christ followers. And again, hospitality is couched in these words. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord at all times. Be joyful 
in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Here it is, practice hospitality. And I love this one. And this is the one that's on the screen. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So for me, the gift of hospitality is not so much about opening my home, although I really love having people in my home, but it's more about inviting people into my space. Uh, wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, it means, literally for me, this is what it means. You are welcome here. I want you to be with me in this moment. I see you. You're safe. I will not judge you. And to the best of my these all given by the Spirit, I'll love you the best that I can. I know some of you very well, and I believe some of you <laughs> have this great gift of the Spirit, the, the gift of hospitality. And so I encourage you today to fan it into flame so that we might be present and be effective in the kingdom of God. I couldn't help but as these guys shared today to know that as they're sharing, the Spirit of God is speaking to hearts and minds, that your hearts and minds, the Spirit stirred that and passion sparked and purpose was being built around that. You started dreaming dreams and that's the Spirit of God confirming. That's part of your gift mix. I've got this awesome picture in my head. I pray for it. I yearn for it daily. I pray for you daily. The picture I have in my mind is you going all throughout the city from your homes to your neighborhoods to your places of employment to the gym to going out to eat to the movies to wherever you guys go. I picture the church going forward in the giftedness of God and being the church in those places fully yielding to the Spirit, having fanned that flame into gift, that whether you find yourself around a dinner table, whether you find yourself with family or conversing with a server or with an employee or with an employer, that the Spirit of God is in that moment, that the Spirit of God is in that place, and the Spirit of God is using your life to advance the kingdom to be the church. That is the picture of what Paul had when he said, Timothy, fan into flame. Church, that commission is our commission today, to know your gift. As Jason was sitting there sharing, I was thinking some of the best teachers on the planet with not like that don't have a pulpit, but they've got a captive audience, is you moms. You moms, you dads, you guys are some of the best teachers in the world. You grandmas, you grandpas, some of the best teachers. And I sit and I think about the gift of mercy. Man, there is somebody in your life who is the biggest pain in the butt. But God's got you there because you have the gift of mercy. And he's got you there to remind that person that even they are loved. And you're showing that when you're merciful. And God's given those of you in here the gift of evangelism, where the person in front of you is the opportunity to share the gospel. And one of the gift mix in that is the gift of hospitality, your space, my space, my space, your space. Church, those with ears to hear, God has qualified you. This gift mix is your competency. It was not given to you by man. It was given you, given to you by God. He's the one who's given it to you. It will not fail. It will beat back the darkness. It will be a light that shines bright in the darkness. Let the love of Jesus shine bright in you. Yield to the Spirit's prompting in your life. Know what that gift is. 
fan it into flame and let it flow from you. I see teenagers over here. I see some of my kids over here in your schools. I pray for it. I, when I walk, when I go by your schools, I pray in Jesus' name that his light would shine bright in your life. Man, you are not off the hook. You're 20-somethings, you're not off the hook. People my age, you're definitely not off the hook. And those who are a little bit further on in life, your hair has got a little less color. That's wisdom, baby, you've earned it. I just shaved my head now to hide some of it. You're not off the hook either. Lord God, thank you for my friends. When you made their life, when they said yes to your invitation to follow you, your son Jesus, you gave them your spirit and you gave them a gift. So God, the way that we talk in private, I just wanna talk with you now, with them present. You love them. I love them. I dream about how you use them. I know it's way more than they can imagine. Holy Spirit, help my brothers and sisters here to dream the impossible. Help them dream God-sized dreams. Let them not treat today like it's just another day. Let them know that gift, God. Give them the perseverance to fan it into flame. Use them beyond anything they could possibly ever imagine. May your kingdom go forth because of your goodness and how they were faithful and how they were obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna take a little bit of a right turn and we're gonna continue in worship this morning by receiving communion. And so I wanna direct your attentions to Jesus. Jesus is God's expression, his demonstration of his love, his deep, deep love for you. He wants you to walk with him daily the way he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He wants you to know the power of his presence. And so Jesus came. We read about the upper room experience. What you may not know is that all of Jerusalem had gathered that night, Passover celebration, to celebrate and remember how God had freed them from the captivity of the Egyptian people. But Jesus was going to do something new that night. He was going to set us free from sin, from guilt, from shame, from fear, from addiction, from hurtful and habit, hurtful uh, habits and hangups. He came to set us free. So you receive some communion elements when you walked in. What I want you to do as the team sits and plays is I want you to remember God's love for you. When they're done playing, I'll come and I'll close this in communion.
to our communion table. You guys can grab a seat. Our communion table is open to all those who are followers of Jesus. If you are not a follower of Jesus, this morning he is inviting you to follow him. He just says, follow me. What that means is we listen to him, we learn from him, and we go in his name. It's not a better way to listen and learn from him than being involved in a local body, having a Bible, getting in God's word and listening to the Spirit speak to you. Being in a community group is another way, other believers, of learning from him. And then every one of us have been commissioned to go. Going back to the upper room. They had always gathered around this bread. But on that night, Jesus was gonna do something that he'd never done or said before with this bread. He took the bread and he broke it. Just go ahead and break that bread, that wafer. And he gave thanks for it. Reminiscent of when he fed the 5,000. Reminiscent of when God fed the children of Israel. That he would be our daily bread. And that his body would be broken for our sins. God saw fit to spare you and me and to place his son Jesus between us in his wrath that Christ's body would be broken for our sins. Today, receive this in remembrance of Jesus' love for you. And Jesus took the cup. And if you remember, if you're familiar with the Passover story that goes all the way back to the book of uh, Exodus, where God was gonna liberate his people from the Egyptians. The final plague was the Passover. It's the angel of death. And so God instructed Moses to have the children of Israel take a, a blemish-free lamb and sacrifice it and to paint the blood of that lamb above their doorposts. And that night as the angel of death went throughout the land of Egypt, all the firstborn were killed, except for the homes that had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. That's what they were there in that upper room celebrating that night. But again, Jesus did something with the cup that had not been done before. He gave thanks for the cup and he said, this is gonna be my blood poured out for your sins. The Lamb of God is John the Baptist said, who takes away the sin of the world. The deepest stain of our sin is washed free through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been made clean through Jesus. Do this with a grateful heart in his remembrance of his deep, deep love for you. Lord God, I just wanna say thank you. If we just turn the lights down on the platform, that'd be great. God, you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus to show us what love is, to what love looks like, so that we could walk with you, we could know you. Thank you for redeeming us through your son Jesus. Jesus, thank you for laying your life down for us so that we might know the goodness of God, for doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before I let you go, just a couple things. One, fan your gift that the Spirit has given you, your gift mix, fan it into flame. As Kinner was talking about how they went out to the, the prison system, I thought that was the greatest prison riot in the history of all prison riots, spurred on by the Spirit of God. It was awesome. And then as Jason Parentoni was speaking, his mom and dad are down here and thinking, man, what a cool moment for mom and dad and just kind of watching that. But if we're honest, it was even a better moment for his wife, Marissa. She's thinking, that's my guy right there. <laughs> so fun. You guys, thanks for being here. I want to invite you, uh, or let me just tell you one quick story. I want to invite you Thursday at one o'clock if your calendars and your schedule will allow it. Some 55 years ago, a family met in their home and they wrote 80 letters and they sent them out across the United States. 
It was an invitation to move to Casper, Wyoming to join God in what they believed God wanted to do, which was to start a church. 80 letters went out almost 50, 55 years ago. Six people responded, six. I wanna show you a, a picture of one of those. There is sweet Marsha Carroll, somebody I call a very stately, lovely woman. She was one of the six that responded to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And she moved out to Wyoming, which would be one of the biggest gifts in her life to just share what God had shared with her. And she gave her life to help pioneer and plant this thing called Highland Park Community Church. This past week on Thursday, she went home to be with Jesus, where she got to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. On Thursday at one o'clock here, we are going to celebrate her life and God's goodness. If you've got time, we would love to, to, uh, to have you here. Also wanted to let you know about next week. Next week, we're gonna talk about something that we haven't really addressed in the eight years I've been here. Just felt prompted that this was the time to be able to talk about it. We're heading towards Easter, and it is really difficult to know how good the grace of God is unless you know the reality of sin. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the reality of hell in preparation for Easter. We're gonna say, we're gonna talk about what the Bible has to say about it. We'll look at what Jesus has to say about it. And then we're gonna look for, hey, where can you see the evidence of it in our daily living? I hope you'll join us for it. I hope you'll bring some friends with you. It is gonna be a powerful, powerful study that gets us ready for Easter. I love you guys. I believe we're God's masterpiece created new in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God planned for us long ago. Thanks for worshiping with us. Thanks for being the church. Go fan that gift in the flame, man. And uh, to God be the glory. Thanks, guys.